Hello, everyone out there. My name is C. Ronald Garner. I'm a 30-year researcher in UFOs. I have uh, spent a lifetime studying the subject. I think I have more knowledge of it than most of the sophisticated researchers out there. Uh, I'm about to give Bob Wood and Jan Harzan some documents that have never before been seen by the general public. I'm hoping that they'll be published in the MUFON Journal so that uh, people out there will know uh, what's going on behind the scenes. For whatever reason, I've been privileged and honored to talk to a half a dozen people that are within the secret government. I know their names. I know where they are. Many of them are recognizable by the general public. But I'm going to give these documents today on January the 23rd, 2015, to Bob Wood and Jan Harzan so they can be published in the MUFON Journal. I just want to make one statement where I'm, why I'm wearing this uh, angel cap. It's a code image for people in the secret program. Those of you out there who know its meaning, you know its meaning. Uh, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, when I was a teenager, a neighbor gave me a book called Flying Saucers Have Landed by George Adamski. And that just took my interest, and uh, I was fascinated up till this day. When I was 18 years old, I married a woman who was a trans medium. And she brought through people then that I didn't know, but I subsequently, my later years, realized that they were entities from other star systems because she spoke different languages. She was a uh, different syntax, totally different person. That was a major experience when I was, and I was married to her for 10 years. Uh, she was an astrologer for major Hollywood people. So I became an astrologer, her assistant, making charts and so forth. And she was doing these readings. Another major turning event was in 1983. I was working for a mortgage company in Beverly Hills. And the woman manager and I went to lunch one day. And uh, she said that her brother worked at Area 51. I said, oh, really? I'd sure like to talk to him. And she said, well, I'll try and set it up. But he's a little funny about talking to anybody. So it uh, turned out that he was a low-level person, just a welder or a carpenter or something. And he, he told her that he would walk by this one office there at Area 51 S4. People need to distinguish between S4 and Area 51 proper. Area 51 proper is what Nellis Air Force Base. That's where they had the B-52s and uh, all of them up there. But S4 is where all the super secret stuff is. It's 15 miles southwest of Groom Lake proper. So she said that her brother told him, or told her that he uh, saw this being in this room who had one brown shoe and one black shoe on and things were all messed up. So he said he went in there one day and he said to this being, he said, why don't you straighten up this place? It's a mess. And the being said to him, quote, hey, look, fellow, I just put on this body every day like you put on your coveralls. So get out of here and don't bother me. Actual quote. So I wanted to go out there and meet with him. But every time I called him, he said there was a white van circling his cul-de-sac. So he was afraid he was being monitored and he would never agree to uh, uh, being interviewed. But, that, but what I just said was direct from his sister, where she'd have no reason to lie to me or to play games anyway. It was just a casual lunch conversation. So then, and I go to Vegas a lot. I have some European friends there. And in 89, when Bob Lazar came on CBS talking about Area 51 S4, uh, that really got my attention with George Knapp. And so there was another confirmation of Area 51 S4, you know, totally separated. Then in 93, I was attending International UFO Congress in uh, Las Vegas, and the speaker there that I was entranced with 
was Bill Uhouse. Now, Bill Uhouse was an engineer, and he was uh, tasked by the Air Force after he got out of the Marines, he was a, a pilot for the Marines in World War II, to go to work at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And he went to work there working on back engineering uh, special projects. So uh, then they transferred him to Los Alamos, and they transferred him also to Area 51 S-4. And he said on camera that uh, at Los Alamos, Edward Teller was there with two beings from a different star system, the blonde, blue-eyed variety, the, what we call the Nordics in ufology. And they were teaching Edward Teller about this uh, science of uh, whatever from their star system. Now, that, that's profound. And I have it in some of my videos uh, of uh, Bill U. House stating that. So uh, this, is the, this is the main part that I see that as the people, researchers, don't get. We're on regular, everyday uh, conversations with these beings from other star systems at the, at, at the Los Alamos, for sure, and Area 51 S4, and probably Dugway uh, grounds and, and Brookhaven and, and wherever. They're, they're coming and going. Either they can manifest uh, and disappear, uh, or they uh, come physically. You know, Richard Dolan calls it the breakaway civilization. I call it an E.T. fifth column. Now, if you just get that concept in your mind that we are being influenced in our finances, in our wars, in all of these various things by people not from this star system. And that's what needs to be researched. And in my books and videos, I touch on it in various ways. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, this interview will spark uh, other in-depth researchers out there to pursue this line of, of thinking. And I can give some hints here along the way. I'm, going to be doing that in a few minutes, of where to look and who to ask. So that leads me into information that I'm going to hand to Jan Harzan right now. This is a uh, compilation of the current members of Majestic. Uh, it's on my website, and it's in my book. But I just want people to know that I'm handing this to him. We'll talk more about that later. Now, the other thing that I need to, to bring out early in this interview is that the Europeans have their equivalent of Majestic 12. It's called the Committee of the Majority. And I have all their names right here in my hand. Now, some of the Majestic people uh, in this country are on the same list that I'm going to be handing Jan Harzan. Uh, these need to be published um, in the MUFON Journal because uh, for some reason, I don't know why this is, but there seems to be more intense research in Europe than the United States. And that's because the secret government doesn't have as much control. That's my opinion. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And uh, this email was sent to me by one of my insiders. Uh, I'm going to hand this to Jan. He can see the date on it. It was uh, January the 27th, 2005. And the handle for my contact, he calls himself Nobody Nobody. And at that time in 05, he was in England. I don't know where he is now. I've lost touch with some of my contacts due to my illness. Now, at, at this point, I'm going to name uh, several 
of the current members of Majestic. I think that people out there will be surprised, um, but they are the current members. Uh, the number one member is J. Michael McConnell. He was director of national intelligence for former President Bush. When Bush left office, uh, Admiral McConnell left also. I have him on video number three on my website uh, when McConnell was being interviewed by Tim Russert on Meet the Press. And I have a voiceover that explains uh, that McConnell is the, um, the soul of Majestic. He, he's, he's a moral compass of Majestic. He tries to keep them in line, the other 11 members. He doesn't always do a great job, but he tries. He's an honest person. The other people on, the, on this that I'm going to name right now uh, are not the greatest. Number two in Majestic is Vice President Dick Cheney. Cheney knows all about this. He was at Area 51 S4 when Dr. Burrish was taking tissue samples from the J-Rod and uh, was there at various other times. He actually has his own one-bedroom apartment. All 12 members of Majestic have their own one-bedroom apartment. I have diagrams of that apartment. It's a step-down uh, living quarters, and they have a uh, closed circuit, everything naturally. And when you're in that facility, I want to give this aside. This is something nobody knows. When you're in the facility, there are armed guards every direction. You can't, when you're in that facility, you can't look down any hallway, uh, any corridor, anything without seeing an armed guard. And that intimidates the people that are working there. You're not about to do something that um, would be untoward if that is facing you. And the other thing that a lot of UFO researchers don't know is that the guards in Area 51 S4 are Navy SEALs. The guards on the outside are Wackenhut, you know, the perimeter, but they're not on the inside. And in my video, I believe it's uh, video number two at uh, area51thetruth.com, endorsements, of, it's a tab at the top, it's endorsements by various people of the Dan Burry story, we'll get into that in a minute, but um, uh, John Lear, Lear Jet fame, uh, tells about when Dan Burrish, microbiologist, Department of Defense microbiologist at Area 51 S4, tells on my video that uh, when he saw the changing of the guard, when the Navy SEALs changed the guard, it's like the Tomb of the Unknown, very professional, just spick and polished, just dynamite, just fantastic. And uh, Dan Burry says on my camera that they knew that he knew if he stepped over that red line, they would shoot him. Now, this is a very valuable asset, um, especially trained microbiologists, but they would shoot him if he stepped over. That's how serious all this is. So, um, the ability that I have had to uh, interact with these people like Bill Uhouse, and later on I interviewed Bill Uhouse's son, uh, Will Uhouse, on camera with Burrage, and he confirms everything that uh, Dan Burrage said uh, as far as the looking glass and so forth. His uh, father told him the same thing, and we can get into the looking glass a little more. Uh, that's a device whereby uh, the secret government can see the past or the future. Not exactly, but approximately. And it can also act as a teleportion, teleportation device. If it's angled at a 90 degree angle, uh, it can be used and has been used as a teleportation device. Now I have some schematics of that. Uh, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know how it works but it has special gases 
uh, argon, krypton, different things, and with lasers. And I have 3D drawings that Michael Surratt did of this, uh, which is uh, another quick story I need to explain. Um, I have Dan explaining it and on one of my videos, and it's done just on a, a blackboard, but I wanted something more in depth. Michael Schratt is a 3D artist and fantastic. I also had Mark McCandless do a lot of work for me uh, because these guys are top artists in their field. So Michael Schratt did these 3D drawings of the looking glass and the clean sphere. The clean sphere is a um, half dome where the atmosphere is controlled. Uh, nitrogen, oxygen, just like we have, but it has 5% hydrogen because this being from another star system requires that. He's from the Zeta Reticuli star system. For some strange reason, here again, synchronicity, uh, the Dan Burry story and the anonymous story, which we talk about a little later, uh, have been somewhat sanctioned. Now, not so much the, the anonymous story, but the Dan Burry story is sanctioned by the secret government. So Dr. Dan Burry, microbiologist, Department of Defense, is a poster boy for disclosure. And I'm the media person that's supposed to make it happen. I thought this would happen five years ago. Mm -hmm. I want to address this quickly, though. I don't know for sure, but five years ago, I was uh, finishing up my book on Dan Burrish, and I had a camera crew coming from Hollywood to interview Dr. Burrish five years ago, and I had arranged for him to meet with these people. We had uh, police escorts. We had the whole nine yards. They were shooting another reality show, and they were, the producer was a friend, so he's going to uh, do the Dan Burry story. Uh, but when I set it up with Dan Burris's mother, Doreen Crane, she got upset because I was going to have her second instead of first. So she told Dan that I was, had treated her disrespectfully, so therefore she wouldn't go on camera and he wouldn't either. At the time, I was really angry about it. I spent a lot of time and money doing, setting all this up. But uh, now I'm glad because what happened was that I started to put my attention on the anonymous story, which I had started in 1996. And it was an extremely important story. But, and I don't throw this out as true, but it's strange that my first bladder cancer came about at the same time, within a couple weeks of my transferring from the Burry story to the anonymous story. I can't prove it. Don't know, but uh, former Congressman Schiff, Sherry Adamack, uh, Stephen Greer's assistant, they both had quick active cancers. Don't know, but it's in the literature. I can name 25 or more people that have died strange deaths. Now, why is this? Why is the secret government murdering people? The first one, which we can talk about in some depth, is the, the first Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal. Now, he's thrown out of the window at Bethesda Naval Hospital. I mean, nobody believes the, the suicide story that there, there was a, um, some kind of a belt wrapped around the radiator and tried to hang him. The whole thing is totally crazy. But Anonymous says that he saw in the CIA files at Langley that on the windowsill was scratch marks where Forrestal was trying to hang on. He didn't try to kill himself. Now, what, what could there be in all of this lore and literature that for over 60 years, they've been murdering people? And this is directly from Anonymous uh, and from the CIA files. So what I think that is and this needs to be pursued big time, is that Anonymous says, and I know this will rock the world, but the Allied po powers won the low-tech war. 
they lost the high-tech war. What does that mean? That means that Hitler and his cohorts had back-engineered craft in the 30s. There's a book, which I don't remember the name, History Channel had it on there, where there was a um, UFO land in the Black Forest. And then, according to Anonymous, uh, back to channelers, uh, the Germans had these channelers. They were channeling these people, blonde Nordics, uh, probably from the Pleiades, and that they were um, teaching the German scientists how to build anti-gravity machines. And I know this co is controversial. When I brought it up at different meetings, people said, oh, no, he didn't, they didn't do that. The UFOs and Nazis, come on. But if you just think logically, Hitler was a half-baked painter. He was a corporal in the, in the army. The guy was a nothing. How could he be inspired uh, to do what he did? Well, I lived for 10 years with a channeler. And I tell you, when you hear these beings coming from another star, from some other dimension, talking to you, it's impressive. And so I, my humble, informed opinion is that Hitler was, was talking to these people. It's documented that he had a huge library of occult literature. Now, I have it from several sources that Rockefeller paid a lot of money to the historians not to put this in the history books. So if we can get this story out, all the his history books have to be rewritten. So let's fast forward to um, 96. In 96, I was working for a publishing company in San Diego. Uh, and I went to lunch with one of my fellow employees. And he told me at the lunch that his father-in-law had worked at Area 51 and been a cryptographer for the Army. and. Uh, he had also been recruited by the CIA. So I said, boy, we got to talk to him. But he didn't want to talk. This is a 96. Uh, but I realized that this was too important and that his life was threatened, his family was threatened. Back to the same thing. They're threatening people. We'll get into why I think it's happening. I think I have the Rosetta Stone of this subject. And uh, the son-in-law, my friend, uh, I have in the book a code name for him, but he said that, that uh, he would work with me, and so I called Linda Moulton Howe. She was in Philadelphia at the time, and she went to who I'm now calling Anonymous. She calls him Cooper, Stein. He has many different code names and went and stayed at his home for three days and audio taped him. Uh, there's 11 90 minute tapes that she taped of him and she put it up on her site. And so, and that's the last time because Anonymous asked her not, to, for her not to contact him anymore ever again after I think it was June of 96. So, um, she actually went on coast to coast and played some of that audio with Art Bell. I think it, it's, it's archived. And Art Bell is blown away. He's saying, Linda, this is the biggest story ever. But I pursued this. I pursued this for over 15 years with the family. And in 2010, uh, his, his final uh, secrecy oath expired. So I was at lunch with the family, Christmas lunch um, in 2010, and they said, finally, you can go public with it. So in 2010 till today, I put together this book, and it's just called Anonymous, and it's basically Linda Moulton Howe's interview, but I went through every page of it and made certain changes with Anonymous that he uh, demanded be changed. That's a long story why that is, but 
Uh, he wrote out his memoirs. I have his handwritten memoirs. He doesn't own a computer. He's not into anything uh, technical that way. He's good at cryptography, but that's a, another story. So uh, that's what the book is, annotated and uh, enhanced by uh, my working with the, with his family. Uh, it's an absolutely true story. Uh, my book right now, which is number one on Amazon, uh, Alien Disclosure at Area 51, I have, in the appendix, I've added the, the current members of Majestic. So I've named two of them, Admiral McConnell and Dick Cheney. Mm -hmm. I'll name the third one, Greenspan. Now, naturally everybody says, how do you know it's Greenspan? I'll just give you a little vignette of something that I learned along the way. Um, the people in the black ops, I mean, they gossip. You know, people in the Secret Service <laughs> gossip about Bill Clinton, what he's doing. I mean, that's what they do. You know, they're just people talking about things. And so uh, back, I don't know, it was six or seven years ago, um, Greenspan, in case you don't know it, is married to Andrea Mitchell, NBC, about 20-some years his junior. So uh, Dan Burish was telling me that the people in the black ops were kidding around about that Greenspan and his wife were in the hot tub, and he threw his back out. Now, that's just me talking to somebody and, and, and the black world. Then on TV the next day, I see Greenspan in a wheelchair. Now, uh, something's, uh, that's just a little vignette. But uh, I've told Linda Moulton Howe, I've told Stanton Friedman, go try and talk to McConnell. Nobody will do it because everybody has their, their books, their videos, whatever their shtick is, they want to promote that. They don't, you know, I'm hoping that this will open the door to some other people. Now, the other one that you need to know about is about Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger knows all about this. He has his own, all of these people on Majestic have their own apartments, one bedroom apartments at Area 51 S4. I have drawings of it. Uh, and so uh, if there was a full court press by some serious journalist, then somebody is going to crack the code. And I think the, the one that's most logical is Admiral McConnell. Uh, because someone told me that someone had asked him about Dr. Dan Burge if he knew him, and he just smiled and walked away. So that's neither confirm nor deny. That to me is an admission. Um, McConnell felt that Dr. Dan Burge, uh, and I've seen his IQ, he has 199 IQ. I've seen it by the top. Uh, army psychiatrist. Now, Kissinger, I think, is about 90-some years old, 92 or whatever. Well, part of this whole program, which we can get into, depending on how much time and so forth, at Area 51 S4 is genetic manipulation, both on the extraterrestrial and on humans. Now, I surmise, in my humble informed opinion, that Kissinger has been enhanced. I mean, we, we know about hybrids, we know different things. Wouldn't surprise me one bit if he leaves to be a hundred and something. Kissinger, you know, his background, but I, I need to explain something. When Anonymous was at Area 51 S4, Eisenhower and Vice President Nixon sent Anonymous and his boss, I call him Jeffrey Wright, code name, to Area 51 to find out what's going on there. So that's what he did. He flew there on Air Force One in 1958, and there was a Air Force colonel there who had to be CIA. John Lear told me there's no just straight Air Force there. They're all CIA. They may wear whatever uniform they want. 
And by the way, um, Anonymous says on my camera that the CIA has a card. They can enter any building in the government, switch that card. They can go into Fort Knox. That's the access that they have on their cards and so forth. Anonymous and his boss talk to this Air Force colonel and says to the colonel, the President of the United States wants to know who runs this place. And the Air Force colonel, codenamed Jim, had a little tag on his shirt, you know, Jim. Nobody uses a real name. That's one of the main reasons Anonymous is alive, because he used different names. But that's another long story. So Air Force Colonel Jim says, well, I guess I am. But the real people, now get this, ladies and gentlemen, that run this place right now are at the Bohemian Grove. Now, what does that tell you? All the big, high mucky mucks uh, have this ritual every year. Kissinger there, you know, all the big shots. Doing what? Paying homage to an owl. In the black ops world, there's a whole esoteric group of people that are talking to channelers, that are out there uh, conjuring all kinds of spirits. And it's an active part of what the black ops do. What do they do all day? They talk to spirits. They uh, start wars, stop wars, do things with the economy, uh, all for some original goal. And this is where we get to what I'm calling the Rosetta Stone of ufology. Why is it that literally hundreds of people have been tortured, murdered, or disastrous things happen to them? What, what could be behind this? 1949, uh, James Forrestal, the first Secretary of Defense. This is 49. This is, you know, two years after Roswell. What could have been known two years after Roswell to take him out? Well, what I think is that there is a secret government. Richard Dolan calls it the breakaway. I call it the fifth column. Why do I call it that? Because what Dan Burrish says to me on camera, it's in my videos, that the J-Rod person, the being that was at Area 51 S4 for over 50 years, was called the ambassador. So as kind of a joke, they, I call them names too. They call them uh, Stumpy and Bright Eyes, making fun of this being from another star system. So if he's telling the, the, our secret government all of these secrets, then there's some kind of communication with these other dimensions. And Dan Burrish, being uh, such an intelligence person, was um, tuned in to this J-Rod person because the J-Rod was on a ship that uh, Dan Burrish was abducted into when he was nine years old at Mayberry Park in Lakewood, California. So they had a communication going on. And part of what Dan Burrish's job was to take tissue samples from this being uh, because he was suffering from a neuropathy disease. And Dan Burrish, microbiologist, would take the tissue samples with a special gun, send it up to the uh, biologists, the cultural people upstairs, change the genome, send it back down through a special tube uh, so there wouldn't be any contamination, reinsert it into the J-Rod. And they didn't cure the neuropathy disease, but they did uh, improve it. And it's interesting that Bob Wood is sitting in front of me right now because he's written a great book called Alien Viruses. Now, why is it, I want to mean one of the reasons that the black ops have kept this a secret all these years is because some of these beings are toxic. If you handle or, or get near them, you can die. Now, the black ops can't come to the general public and say, well, sorry folks, some of these people 
are dangerous. And um, I, when I've given a few talks, and I mentioned your book, in fact, I have it in one of my videos, Bob, and um, I mentioned that, that uh, uh, Dr. Roger Lear and I went to Virginia, and there was this creature down there. There was four of them that were captured by the local firemen and turned over to the Army. And those creatures are, are big eyes, protuberances on the head, sort of a red, reddish uh, complexion. And um, so Roger Lear and I went down there in the mid-90s uh, to try and interview this orthopedic surgeon that had operated on this being. The uh, being in um, Virginia, Brazil, and um, John Mack went down there also earlier than Roger Lear and talked to the two girls that saw the being, talked to the girl's mother, interviewed him. And I've talked to Danny Sheehan, who's close to the family, and has said that he thinks that he could get his footage. So anyway, what the plan was with Roger Lear and I, when we went to Brazil, we had a really good time down there. The people in Brazil are just wonderful. Um, was to interview this orthopedic surgeon that um, had operated on this bean. Because uh, a year before, Dr. Roger Lear had gone down there on his own uh, with A.J. Gabar to translate. And he interviewed uh, this orthopedic surgeon. What he said was, uh, A.J. Gavard set up this meeting uh, with the orthopedic surgeon, and this is basically what the orthopedic surgeon told him, is that one early morning, about 2 or 3 o'clock, he was called into the hospital, and he didn't know why, but he came into the hospital operating room, and here was this creature on the operating table, with a compound fracture, and I, we don't know which leg it was, uh, but there was a military uh, group outside, there was military people inside the door, outside the door, and there was this Brazilian general that told the orthopedic surgeon, get in there and fix it. And that, that's what military people would say, just fix it. The guy, the guy's got a broken leg, just fix it. So the orthopedic surgeon, approached this being uh, and put a splint on it and did whatever he had to do. And uh, there was like a green mist that just filled the room. And in one day, it was totally healed. And the being telep telepathically told the orthopedic surgeon that in their world, they heal with their mental powers. They don't need intervention by uh, the doctors, uh, which I think is fascinating. Uh, so when we went down there together, I had to come back early. So Roger with A.J. Gavard went to see this orthopedic surgeon again. This time he denied everything. He said it didn't happen because they had gotten to him. So Dr. Roger Lear, one of our many projects was to uh, with Jaime Masson, spirit this orthopedic surgeon and his family out of Brazil to Mexico, and then him have go on camera and tell the real story. Now, it didn't happen, but A.J. Gavard told me uh, three or four years ago that there's new information, so we need to find out what new things are going on in Brazil and Virginia and all down there. So the point I'm making here because this is apropos to Dan Burridge. He says all the time, I've never met an alien, but I have met an extraterrestrial. What's the difference? Well, my difference, uh, what I can contribute to the difference is, an alien is like this creature in Brazil. It's totally alien. There's no genome of humans in there. And uh, whereas an extraterrestrial is a human from our future, which gets into time travel. And Linda Moulton Howe said, wonderful research, I just love her to death, <laughs> at her presentation at Contact in the Desert, 
July of last year, of uh, 2014, talked about eternal now. There is no future or past. How do, when someone has a de deja vu experience, what are, they're slipping time, both present and past. Art Bell went on his show years ago and said he was living in an apartment uh, with a sliding gas, glass door out to a parking lot, which his car was parked there. So he was sitting there reading or something, and he saw a car crash into his car. Well, he got up, he went out there, opened the door, nothing. About 15 minutes later, the car crashes into his car. So there's a slippage of time there. And uh, Willie Strieber says the same thing, that he was driving with his son, teenager, and his son's friend somewhere on the New Jersey Turnpike or someplace, and they turned off to get some lunch, and they pulled up to this diner and had a wonderful lunch, you know, three people, and cost $2.87. And so Willie Strieber said, what, what's this? So they leave, and go where they, and then way back, well, let's stop at that diner. So they stop at the diner, there's no diner there. And they asked one old coot there in the gas station, well, we came through here a week ago and there's a diner. Said, oh, that burned down 40 years ago. So, you know, and people that are watching this probably have had that experience in their life where there's a slippage, either forward or backward. Uh, because we're interdimensional beings, we have a soul that's eternal uh, and that we can tap into that soul force uh, on, on a regular basis. That's what you do in dreams. You're activating all of that. So the part that, that I'm emphasizing here in this last part of this is that uh, as far as I know, people in ufology, except for Jim Mars, Jim Mars get into the German connection, the Fourth Reich. And uh, that's a major, major reason for the cover-up, is that Operation Paperclip, when all of those German scientists came here, they came with all their Gestapo. And on my camera, Bill Uhau says that when you are in the black ops world, you have a, your own personal handler. Dan Burrish has it. Uh, Dan Burry is, 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 is this big, heavy-set guy called Little John. That's his handler. So when you're in the black world, you have a handler. He's with you your whole life. He knows everything about you. He knows your family. He knows your illnesses. He knows your weaknesses, your strengths. And every so often, you have to take a lie detector test. They monitor you all the time. That's why these people don't come forward. And sometimes, uh, you know, bad things happen. So uh, that's, the, the, that, that's the level of secrecy that you're subjected to if you rise to these levels. So uh, when McConnell uh, was talking to Dr. Dan Burrish, basically as his godfather, he looks after him, all these other microbiologists are dead, but Dan Burrish will be 52 February the 2nd of this year. So McConnell asked Dr. Dan Burrish to become number nine on Majestic. Well, Burrish was reluctant. They said, well, okay, this is in two, early 2005. So uh, they had a meeting, and that's the same time frame that uh, I got that email that I just gave to you gentlemen. So uh, Dan Burry suggested in April of 2005 that uh, there be a vote for or against disclosure. And the vote in April of 2005 was six to five for disclosure. In September of 2005, it was eight to three for disclosure. Now, I don't know who's for and who's against, but uh, that vote was taken. When those votes are taken, they're never reversed. So the next logical question, if in 2005 
Why isn't it revealed? I don't know for sure. My opinion is that, and my information, is that there's a time frame. There's different time frames. And the ET people, uh, at least this main group, the, the J-Rod type people, the greys as we call them, numbers are everything. So that's why Dr. Dan Burrish was nine, because uh, nine is, is triple three. And that's the whole significance. So why they haven't revealed it? Dan told me that years ago that it was 15, 16, and 17 were the critical years. And it may be happening as we speak. I just heard on the news the other day that Hillary Clinton is hiring John Podesta as her transition person, was he was a transition person for Obama. And Podesta has said the National Press Club that the extraterrestrials are here, it's a part of the law, we should present it. Now that's pretty significant that a potential Democratic nominee for the President of the United States, and she knows a lot about this subject. She was uh, given a lot of information from Rockefeller and Kissinger. You tied Kissinger back into the Rockefeller initiative. And uh, so I've held this information back. I haven't told anybody till here the last part of my life. I don't know how long I got, but the best that I, whatever I got, I'm going to try and get this information out. Uh, the 30 years that I spent on it were very valuable. I, um, I'm very pleased and honored to the people from the inside the secret government have um, been, a been able to get this information to me. They knew that I was an honorable person, that I would disclose certain things, hold other things back. <laughs>
And when I told him that, he ordered Majestic to stand down, as far as I'm concerned. So after 05, 06, I never had any more problems. Uh, so that's kind of clout that he has through McConnell. I'll give you another little vignette, uh, which is apropos what I was saying earlier, is that these beings are toxic. That's why the J-Rod was in this clean sphere, totally controlled environment. And Dan Burrish had to be in a TES, totally encapsulated suit because we didn't want to contaminate them or vice versa. So Dan Burrish, he goes into great detail in my videos, is that when he comes to work at Area 51 S4, he has to strip down to the nude and be weighed and make sure that he hasn't hidden something in some orifice of his body and you're weighed when you leave. And when you're at your workstation, you're being the workstation, you're being weighed. So uh, I talked to John Lear about this, and he said that I asked John if Bob Lazar was weighed. He said no. That uh, when Bob Lazar was at Area 51 S4, he took a little tiny camera, took it in there, and put it in the stanchion of a chair. And he would take a picture and bring it out. And then when he was uh, never, people don't know, Bob Lazar was never fired. He just left because he was afraid that he went back out there. He'd never come back. It'd be his bones in the desert. But so they found the camera. This is Don Lear talking. And the camera uh, was what decided from then on, Dan Burry, everybody else had to be weighed in the nude. <laughs> and so they have to go that protocol all the time. Every time they go there, and Dan, at one point, was going there a couple times a week. And just another aside, I like this part of the story, is that Dan Burrish, microbiologist, specially trained at State University of New York at, St at Sony Brook, and uh, he was trained specifically to work with the J-Rod. And Edward Teller paid for his education at State University of New York. And on my site, my other site, my, what I'm calling my academic site, area51jrod.com, I have uh, all the documents. Originally, I had 95 documents. I cut it down to 45 now, it's, and it was just too much. But you can download all those documents. It's PhD, uh, the, the one, the PhD from State University at, uh, at uh, Stony Brook has been erased but we have another one, a substitute one that's up there. I have letters from the dean where he's on the honor list, straight A. He got one B, B plus or something in Spanish. <laughs> but uh, he's a very intelligent person. And he thinks in terms of uh, fractals. I introduced him to J.J. Hertek, and who wrote the book uh, Keys of Enoch. And it's, it's all about these other dimensions and the, uh, the fractal images. So he's, and he's a pretty good artist, and his wife is pretty good too. So they, they have given me a lot of information because, you know, back five, six, seven years ago, I was the designated hitter uh, for this information getting to the general public. And uh, wherever you want to go from there. Well, Bob was, uh, I think, asking the question. Uh, I, I've got a question, but Bob was asking the question: um, How much influence do the extraterrestrials have on the current state of affairs on the planet, such as as the New World Order and where that's all right. headed? But before you answer, I had a question. I've had a number of people tell me that they've been to Area 51, and every one of them, without exception, has said there are no aliens there, or at least they didn't meet an alien there. I'm assuming that is because the ETs are actually at S4, which is right. not really Area 51. It's That's right, yeah. To the south. Exactly right, yeah. Yeah, as far as the New World Order, uh, I don't know, you know, and I always say either I uh, know or I don't know. Uh, I try and stay away from the word belief. That's a toxic word to me, because <laughs> belief implies religion or, you know, either you know or you don't know, or it's a maybe. Uh, so all of the New World Order 
has to do with what we were discussing a few minutes ago about uh, timelines and that if certain things happen, it changes the timeline. So when Dr. Dan Burish changes the genome of an extraterrestrial, this changes their whole culture. And uh, just an aside, I, I love this uh, little vignette about Dan interacting with the J-Rod. Now, he interacted with the J-Rod for two years, 94, 95, and some maybe of 96. He's a being from another star system, but they consider themselves friends. So what do friends do? What do you do when you're talking to your friend? You start talking about your childhood or what, where you came from and so forth. So the J-Rod asked Dr. Dan Burrish, uh, you know, what happened in your childhood? What, what was it like, you know? So Dan Burrish um, started reflecting on his childhood and, and watching cartoons. So he starts telling, telling him about Cecil the Sea Six Sea Serpent. And that was the cartoon that he watched. And that he liked, you know, I'm coming, Beanie Boy, I'm coming, Beanie Boy. So people in this room are old enough to remember. People watching probably wouldn't. But from then on, the J-Rod, as sort of a joke, uh, called uh, Dan Burry's B and A. He didn't call him Beanie. B and A separated the syllables. B and E. He said, B and E this, D and E that. So the J-Rod's asking him, B and E, you know, uh, what other images uh, the child had? And so Dr. Burry says, well, uh, one of my favorite times as a child was going to Yosemite Park and the waterfalls and the beautiful trees and everything. So he's imaging this in his mind. The J-Rod is reading it. Everything is tele telepathic with that being. So the J-Rod just let out a sigh. Oh, it's wonderful. The water, the green. And uh, on his planet, it's very dry and it's hot. They have two suns. And that's why, in my opinion, they have the, the double eyelids because they have to filter out the heavy sunlight. So one of the reasons they like to come here is a nice vacation. They got all this water and dim sunlight and, and, and things in their relatives that from their past, what we consider our future. So uh, if they're here and they're interacting, and this is, gets into depth, what you just asked, Bob, which is, this is something that in-depth researchers don't get, is that how many different races, several hundred on planet Earth, well, how many different races are there in the solar system? And they don't all get along. We all lump them together, you know, like in Independence Day, oh, come down and save us, Jesus, and all this. No, no. No, the Nordics are really good, you know, and uh, some group of Nordics Hitler hooked into. At some point, uh, they cut Hitler loose, you know, for whatever reason down the, you know, whatever. That's another whole discussion about South America and Antarctica, and we get back into that, which we can do. But um, uh, from my research, I don't know, Bob and yours, there's, I think, actually more sightings in South America than in North America. I don't know. But A.J. Gavard, you know, we have uh, on coast to coast, uh, Peter Davenport said well, there's like 5,000 a month or something. Well, if there's more in South America, and there's a difference in the abductions, which uh, I've never quite figured out. I've wanted to ask A.J. Gavard that is that the people in South America seem to be more reluctant at abduction. They hold on to trees and branches and as they're taken aboard the ship. And uh, I might as well throw this in here right now. I don't remember being abducted myself, but uh, when I was a teenager, I had some serious nosebleeds. And I've got, I broke my nose playing football, so there's something going on in my nose that I don't know about. But in 1995 or 96, when uh, uh, John Mack's book came out, I was with a group of abductees out in uh, Thousand Oaks. 
uh, with Roger Lear and some other people. And on the way home, I was on the freeway uh, on the 101, and uh, then about two hours, it was like two in the morning when I noticed the time, then about 3.30, I was on the 10 freeway coming from Santa Monica. Now there's a on-ramp from the 101 into the 10, but that means I would have had to get off the off-ramp, get back on the freeway to come back. So uh, that's missing time that I have. Now I've never been regressed, so I don't know uh, about you know the details of that. I never felt the need to that. And I often say to people, they say, well, should I be regressed? And I say, well, if nothing's bothering you, not a good idea to wake sleeping dogs. Uh, just my opinion. Uh, but uh, if something's bothering you, yeah, if there's some trauma, uh, but I wouldn't do it unless there's some real reason for it. But uh, A.J. Gavard and the other researchers in South America talk about the, the natives and the people being, you know, taken aboard, I mean, really fighting it big time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that may be one group of ETs that have infiltrated the, the German contingent in South America. And that's a whole other thing that should be researched with A.J. Gavard because if Operation Paperclip and we brought all these Gestapo uh, intelligence, you know, Nazi intelligence people, they just fit right into the CIA. And the Gestapo would be so happy with, with of having everything revealed in the, and, and the populace, they know whatever, they know we're sitting here and doing this, they know everything. Uh, my phone, I'm sure, is tapped. I just figure that it is. Linda Howe, everybody says. Uh, but that leads me to this question that maybe uh, these intelligence groups are trying to hear what one group of ET is talking to another group of ET about. You know, there's some, uh, and there's some database someplace where these different intelligence groups are feeding information about which group is doing what, and how that changes the timeline. Now, I think, this is just my speculation, that the way New World Order and all of this esoteric things works, you have to be at perpetual war. The only way you can hide these budgets are as if you're at war. So we've been in per perpetual war. We lost in, in Korea, we lost in Vietnam, uh, we lost in, in Afghanistan, we lost in Iraq. Someplace, somebody's got to get it that we can't control the world with our military. We're not an international police force. But they have to have it. The cabal, which is what, like five corporations control all the money. So they've got to be uh, having the war so they can hide money and, and uh, launder it through different sources and uh, all of that. And so um, I think that the revelation has to come, I say this to people, I don't know for sure, it has to come for the grassroots. Well, you can't get more grassroots than Ron Garner sitting here in January of 2015 with three people trying to figure all this out. This is as grassroots as it gets. And I think that this information, if it's uh, disseminated in a way that uh, other in-depth researchers. Now, I'm sure there's people like Ron Garner out there that have not gone public very much. I've only given a couple talks here and there, uh, Rachel Nevada a few times and so forth. Uh, but uh, I've interviewed John Lear in great depth. I really know about a lot about Bob Lazar. Now, Corso, uh, said that we are at war with aliens. And at chapter 17 of his book, The Day After Roswell, he lays it out. But he says that they're clones. And uh, how do you know that they're a clone? Well, I tell people, ask them to show you their belly button. If they don't have a belly button, then they gotta be a clone. And that's what the, the, the uh, images from uh, alien autopsy are is a being with a pop belly and no belly button and no genitals, or not that they showed anyway. Uh, which brings up this issue 
of the black ops and uh, the controversy over alien autopsy film. The, the big issue on and off when it first came, was it true or not true? That's the way humans think. It's black or it's white. There's no in between. And, but everything with this group of intelligence people is in between. That's what they do. And there's this term called a meme. You need to look that up. A meme is an idea that's put out there and that becomes a part of the genre. And the meme of this autopsy was that there was an autopsy. And I have an autopsy that Dan Burry saw and Anonymous saw and most people don't know, but Bob Lazar saw. So this meme, uh, one of the important parts of it is that in the alien autopsy showed there was two eyelids. Now, Philip Corso, in his uh, interview, said that uh, the autopsy film that he saw at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, that the Army showed him, showed that the uh, second, or that there were two eyelids. And at that time, nobody knew about two eyelids. So the black ops, in my opinion, uh, show this film of a being with two eyelids. That's putting it out there. And Corso says in his book and on camera that that uh, eyelid is a light gathering. That's what the night vision came from. The night vision was the eyelid that gathers light so the ET people can see in the dark. So Corso said that um, uh, his boss sent him to, uh, I forgot which, which company right now, but they were working on night vision, but it was as big as a tank or a hauler or something. And so Corso went there with an envelope. He said, sometimes I'm Scrooge. This time I'm Santa Claus because uh, here's $60 million. That's the good news. The bad news is that you have, you have to build this night vision goggles. That's what the money's for. The bad news, you gotta do it in 12 months because our soldiers need it in Vietnam. So the, the technology that they got from the ET people saved lives of lots of soldiers in Vietnam. In the same way with the computer chip. They don't say this is from an alien ship. They just say it's from an Italian helicopter. Or it's from a, a Russian MiG or whatever, you know. <laughs> uh, and so uh, my take is that Corso got a bad rap, all because of Hollywood. And he just didn't get his story out there. Now, I've been talking to Philip Corso Jr. People don't know it. But Philip Corso wrote a book called The Day After Dallas. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> that means that Corso was in the White House at the same time that Anonymous was in the White House, the late 50s, early 60s. He probably passed in the hall at some point. Uh, Anonymous says that, um, that he uh, thinks he saw Corso's boss one time in in the White House, but he didn't know for sure uh, what the Trudeau, uh, you know, Trudeau. I had uh, two questions. One, are we putting McDowell in any, I'm sorry, McConnell in any jeopardy by talking about him on this video? Oh, well, he probably has more bodyguards than anybody, than the president. But I just an aside there, um, uh, with McConnell, um, when I was hiring these private investigators to go after Kissinger and, and these other people, and I mentioned McConnell, he said, are you crazy? I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. This is the director of all the spooks in the world. Give me a break. I wouldn't do it for $100 million. No, <laughs> so the, the private investigator that I hired to check out some of the members of Majestic, where they live, what they do, what's going on. He gave me some information, but... Do you know anything about John Alexander? Yeah, he's a criminal, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, 
because he's a disinformation specialist. He's, he's come around a little bit in later years, but he says there's no cover-up and blah, blah, blah. And there was a one uh, at the International Congress a few years ago, some speaker didn't show up, so Bob Brown put, it, put him in there, Alexander in there. And people booed him off the stage. The guy is this total disinformation. He's modified a little bit. Uh, but then Bob Brown went up and told him you'll never be invited to hear it again. What you have to set up there is total baloney. Earlier, you were talking about the idea that J. Rod said that he was happy he was here because it was so hot on his planet with right. the two suns. Does that in any way relate to the story about Project Serpo? I think it does, but I don't know how. I didn't buy the Serpo story originally. Uh, Dan Burge didn't buy it. But now that I studied a little bit more, I think there's something to it. Uh, just what and how. I can discuss that a little bit if you want. Serpo was fascinating. Um, but the question is, did any of your whistleblowers have Serpo-related evidence? Uh, just tangentially, not, not directly, except for Dan Burrish. Um, Dan Burrish was working with this J-Rod in the mid-90s. And toward the end of 96, uh, normally, when Dan Burrish would go into the clean sphere, he had to take one step forward, feet together. One step forward, feet together, like in a, a wedding a ceremony. That was respect for this ambassador, in quotes, from another star system. So, uh, and the protocol was never turn your back on this person. Uh, so, he... Uh, late in their relationship, well, approached the J-Rod, and the J-Rod, as a joke, because J-Rod had a great sense of humor. They were joking around a lot. And the J-Rod, as a joke, made a step toward him for the first time. First time in two years. Well, this frightened Dan so much, he caught his heel on the graded floor and fell backwards on his filter pack because he had a totally encapsulated suit and it was filtered through the back. So uh, the J-Rod then, he didn't jump, he, could, he was sick. He sort of loped over. Uh, I mean, they had to clean him up. He was drooling and vomiting. He was a sick person. So J-Rod climbed up on Dan's chest and downloaded all his information. People in the black ops called Dan Burrish a galactic encyclopedia because the j Ron had all this information that he downloaded. And Dan Burrish has this indebted memory, this memory that you can remember everything. You can ask Dan Burrish right now, when he was at Long Beach Hospital learning biology from Dr. Reynolds, uh, what color the wall was in the receptionist's office. He'll tell you. He'll tell you which way the desk faced, you know, right, left, he has this, it, it, it's a gift. You know, just certain people have it, probably Stephen Hawking's and whoever else has, you know, it's an enhancement. And that's when Dan was enhanced when he was taken on board the ship from uh, Mayberry Park in Lakewood when he was nine years old. He was enhanced purposely to try and heal this J run. This is why I'm saying that the timelines change if you do certain procedures or economy does certain things, or we go to war certain ways, and all that stuff. So Dan Burrish is getting all this information, and Zygmunt Brzezinski was in the observation platform at the time. So at that time, they didn't have anybody suited up in this totally encapsulated suit to get him out of the clean sphere. So it took about a half an hour, and uh, Zygmunt Brzezinski and whatever other group of Majestic watched all this, asked Zygnu. And so, uh, and Dan was in a coma for about a day or two after that. When this uh, being from another star system climbed up on his chest, they ramped up the pressure. They, they could have killed the J-Rod. Now this is a being from another star system. They're gonna protect their guy, screw the other guy. Dan is saying, no, 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 he had too many, 
means of communication. One was to the scientists who are doing all this research, and one is to uh, security. So when he's saying no, 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 he's saying no, no, no to them not to ramp up the pressure to harm this being. They thought he was saying no, 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 stay away from me, J-Rod, because, and so there was a little confusion there. I had to get that straightened out. And he told them, you know, but this is another explanation of that. When uh, Dr. Dan Burrish goes in to meet the J-Rod, he has to go through all these protocols of, of washing him with all these special liquids and all that stuff so he can't contaminate. So he has to um, go through this uh, hallway or whatever, however they have it set up. And the protocol is you never turn back. Once you start down that gantry, you don't turn back. But just so, so happened one time, Admiral McConnell was there in his civvies and saw Dan, and Dan in his suit turned around and gave him a big hug. From that time on, Dan was a star. Everybody said, this is McConnell's guy. He's younger in age and seniority, but the main guy's hugging this guy, you know, in the decontamination chamber. So from then on, Dan was king of the realm. Whatever he wanted, you know, you're, you're the main guy. So Ron, you said that uh, Dan Burge was abducted at the age of nine for the purpose of Enhancement for the future for things. Later, when he would meet J. Rod. Right, like 27 years later. To help J. Rod get well. Right, that's right. Okay, so I just want to make sure that. That's yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so the second question I have is, you mentioned at the beginning of this conversation that J. Rod had said to <clears throat> Dan, "We don't put splints on things, or we don't, we don't." No, no, no this is the being in in Virginia. That's a different. Oh, a different being. Okay. That that's a creature, uh, oh. in Virginia. Okay. We uh, use our no. mind to heal ourselves. Yeah, that's in, that's in Brazil. That, that, that had nothing to do with J-Rod. Okay. But J-Rod obviously didn't have the ability to heal himself by his mind or however the other No, uh, obviously not, because they were trying okay. to heal him. Right. And, um, but part of that power of the mind addresses what the uh, black ops want Dr. Dan Burry's microbiologist, Department of Defense, want him to do which is to translate what the J-Rod says into English. So each time he would spend with the J-Rod, they would debrief him. But he, he only told them about 20%. But the black ops didn't pursue it too much. You know, they didn't want to irritate Dan and, you know, by asking too many questions. But uh, this leads us to the, the big finale which is that uh, because of this looking glass device, um, they can turn it into a stargate. There is a stargate in Abydos, Egypt right now. There's a certain part of it. I have it diagrammed. And so the, uh, the Black Ops was uh, going to open the Stargate in December 2003. And so they needed to have Dan Burris there so that, and with the J-Rod. So there would be Dan Burris and the J-Rod in the desert of Abydos, Egypt, when they opened this Stargate. Because they wanted to communicate, not like in the movie Stargate, but uh, they wanted to communicate with these people that were going to arrive possibly from Serpo. You know, I'm talking about Serpo. That's what makes me think maybe Serpo's real. Uh, so they had Dan Burris there, and when uh, they moved the J-Rod from one place to another, this clean sphere, I mean, what they had to do to get that in there originally is amazing. Um, so they developed uh, what I call a scooter with a dome over the top, like a Pope mobile kind of thing, you know. And they had this atmosphere in there because they had the J-Rod in there. And they're approaching this, what looked like from 100 yards, like a mud wall. 
And the plan was, is that whatever came through this interdimensional uh, portal uh, to the J-Rod, to Dan Burrish, that's why I say the esoteric part of this is never addressed in, in ufology, because it's beyond their pay grade. They don't, I've studied esoteric things all my life. So what happened was, uh, the J-Rod in his mind is, uh, is appealing to Dr. Dan Burrish. Help me, B&E, help me. I want to go home. He missed his wife and his child, just like we would. He wanted to get back to Zeta Reticuli. He's been here for over 50 years in this so-called ambassadorial suite. So Dan's saying, is, I can't do that, you know, I don't. But then Dan just said, screw it. So he hit that controller and forced that, um, that scooter, whatever we call it, into the wall. <laughs> J-Rod disappears, the scooter bounces back, Dan Burrish bounces back, and with no clothes on, just stripped, and all of the Navy SEALs black with the automatic weapons, and McConnell's there, don't shoot, don't shoot, that's Dan, that's Dan, because he was thrown back onto the, uh, whatever they have there, cement, that's something or other. So uh, they had to medevac him out or, or to an aircraft carrier out there after that experience. So what's the, what's the implication, the inference? We need to have a whole section on inference and implications of all this, is that um, they have this interdimensional connection, either with physical things like a mud wall and a, uh, but it has to be like in a place like Abydos, Egypt. People know Egypt as being um, a spiritual, in quotes, place, but it's, uh, it's much more than that. It's, you know, it's, uh, I mean, all of Egypt and you get into ancient aliens and Dan Burrish is a genius at reading uh, graphics and fractals and everything. He is deciphering right now. He has 500 individual diaries of UFO beings' writings, their writings. I think, I don't have it with me, but I have a sample. Where did he get those from? From the J-Rod, when he downloaded all his information. Then he wrote it all out, and that's part of his research. So, Ron, I had a question. Um, we're hearing a lot these days about um, jumping. Uh, Moore Eisenhower and, and different people coming out and saying that they've been to Mars. So they go into a jump room and they jump. Was any of that ever discussed with any of the witnesses you met? Uh, no, just that Dan Burrage doesn't believe Serpo was true. But I don't think Dan knew too much about Serpo at the time. Well, one of the most exciting things that I've learned today is that Edward Teller had personal interactions with the aliens about Oh, yeah. Hours. Bill Uhouse, I have it on camera. And uh, uh, Teller was at the head of the conference table in Los Alamos. And there were two beings there. And uh, They were Nordics? Nordics. And Dan Burrish was at some meeting, not, not with Edward Teller. But if you go on my site, Alien Disclosure at Area 51, go to the appendix, and you will see a document, a uh, three and a half page document, written by McConnell. Uh, Stanton Freeman wants signatures and watermarks. I mean, uh, that brings up, I don't do that. Bob does that, I love you, man. But that, that's not my shtick. I'm not gonna go there. I take the people around that hand me something, they know what they're talking about. So in this letter, it explains why Dan Burrish was chosen, why Bob Lazar was chosen, and the background of all of this. This is my McConnell himself. So if somebody will download it or get the book, the Kindle book, or you can download it from area51jrod.com, all of those documents are downloadable. So you can, it takes a while to do it, but for the in-depth researchers, which I'm hoping MUFON will flush them out of the woodwork. People like me that have been behind the scenes uh, that will 
uh, expand th this, these bits of information. Well, over the years, you've been giving or lending us hard copies of some of these documents. Right. Are those basically the same things that are on right. the website now? Yeah, right, right. Some of the same things. So that uh, because in this field, you know, Corso says it. They don't have to cover up anything. Ufologists will cover up by fighting among themselves. You know, that just goes with the territory. And the people are people and they, they want their book, their video, their stick on it, you know. Uh, but there are people, you know, God bless them, Jim Mars and Linda Howe and, and Richard Dolan and Timothy Good. In fact, I'll just throw this as a good place to put this in there. I often say to people, here in the hospital, and you know, people, well, got 30 years, uh, give me the, the whole thing of UFOs in two minutes. Yeah. I say to them, I'm sorry, but if you haven't read three books, I don't want to talk to you. You got to read Day After Roswell, Timothy Goods, Above Top Secret, and um, what was the third book? Oh, uh, Behold a Pale Horse. Yeah. Until you read those three books, don't talk to me. Because you have no, you have no background, no context, nothing to, to contribute. I do have several questions that I wanted to ask about. Okay. Uh, first one was, what's the status of the Eagles Disobey screenplay from 2004? Is that just? Uh, uh, I, I I wrote a, a treatment on it, but it never went anywhere. Okay. Uh, I gave it to the screenwriter people, and okay. it's in limbo now. Right. Have you been personally threatened by people who do not want to see your whistleblower information released? I've been visited by Homeland Security. Okay, really? And in a nice sort of way. Sort they of they identified way. themselves, sort of? Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't a covert? No, they identified themselves and said, well, right, well certain good. certain things shouldn't be talked about. It would be a good idea. And, yeah. But, you know. It's covert, it's a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> Have you signed any contracts? with individuals or entities that would control the publication or release of what no. we were talking about? No. Well, um, no, nothing. Uh, on the anonymous story, I have total control of, uh, I have a 13-page legal document okay. that says that Ron Garner, Stargate Productions, has total control of everything, the videos, audios, everything. And that was signed in February of 2013. So you get copyrights of the Stargate. Right, everything, yeah. yeah. And uh, Daniel Sheehan, I just talked to him yesterday, uh, went back and met with Anonymous in um, July of last year where he ver verified everything I just said. Now, this leads to what I was saying earlier, that Majestic, there's the 12, sure, but there's all kinds of subordinates all over in academia, in the media, everywhere. They got them... Uh, and there's some kind of mind control. That's another discussion that you can have. Uh, and that uh, I'll just name them. So I'm, I'm not holding back. That's the thing I plan to tell people. Dan Burry still has security oaths. Ron Garner doesn't have security oaths. So I can tell you what's going on. So um, the mathematician at Caltech, his last name is Hunemann. H-O-U-N-M-A-N. -N. He's Majestic. So when Majestic people saw the future, they saw in a future publication of Caltech, could be 50 years, 100, who knows, in the future, something about the Ganesh particle. What's the Ganesh particle? So they decided to have Dr. Dan Burrish, microbiologist, Department of Defense, find out about the Ganesh particle. Mm -hmm. Or they already knew that he knew about it, but it go in, in depth. So Hunemann set it up and George, oh, he's a math, what is a math? Well, because that's what they do. They have overlapping te and technologies and, and everything in the world is based on math, you know, in the universe. And Zeta Reticuli, everything is math. You know, and someday we'll get there. So Hunemann set it up for Dan Burrish and his assistant then, his wife now, Marcia, to give this presentation at Caltech, April 2008, 
I was the cameraman. I have a video. I'll give it to you. And where he explains about the Ganesh particle. And he named it Ganesh because of the Hindu god Ganesh, the elephant god, which is a breaker of obstacles. So he explains this Ganesh particle. And this Ganesh particle heals anything it touches. It's a special kind of quartz crystal, and it sends out a little thing and then it touches another cell, and that cell is healed. So in this presentation at Caltech, it's way beyond uh, my pay grade and probably beyond Bob's, but at some point we should show that to some microbiologists and you know people that are familiar with the field and analyze it. Is it baloney? Is it whatever? And I'll tell you the story, how he found it out. It's a fascinating story. They use remote viewers. So in 2001, the black ops people, I know who some of them were, were doing remote viewing. And they came up, the remote viewers, that there was something uh, on Frenchman's Mountains, about 10 miles from downtown Las Vegas, that was really important. So Dan goes up there in 2001, and he's just looking around, curiosity, and I've been there myself. It's in one of my videos. And in fact, it's in the Caltech video. I show what's going on there. And uh, this being just sort of appears out of the royal, like an Indian shaman guy. Where did you come from? And uh, the Indian says, well, if you shine a light on that rock, It'll catch fire. Dan says, oh, really? And the guy just sort of wanders off or whatever. So Dan goes back home. He gets a laser. He shines it on the rock. It catches fire. Now, this guy's 199 IQ. Curiosity off the charts. He wants, how can that happen? How can a laser on this rock? So he began to analyze microbiology, the rock, the special crystal, quartz crystal. What does it mean? How does it work? And what he discovered was that this uh, is an ancient, and this is what they're, what I, this is just my opinion. Dan's not saying this, but this is the, uh, what they're trying to do in Switzerland with the God particle for billions of dollars. Dan did it for a few thousand. <laughs> you know, the hydrogen computer. Thank you.